This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Brunoli's principle, the shape of the pipe along with an innovative intake system creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing smoking experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. If you're a traveling artist, they even have a space to rent that you can temporarily call home. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com. Hey, three, two, and one. Hey, 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 what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 175. Oh my goodness, the more these numbers get higher, the more I'm like, holy shit, (laughs) 175 episodes, man. Well, thanks for tuning in today. This is Jason Michael, your host, and today's guest is Topher. Uh, He goes by the original Topher on Instagram. You can find him out there. I'll have his links in the show notes as well. And uh, Topher and I had a fun conversation. Uh, Him and I were introduced to each other via the Tournament of Fire that uh, Cherry Glass and Friends put on uh, a couple months back. Uh, Him and I were paired head-to-head against each other, and he beat me in that tournament. I think it was by like 14 votes or some crazy shit. But uh, him and I have connected and stayed friends and stayed in touch since then, and uh, we've been trying to get him on. And after hurricanes and power outages and everything else in the process, I was finally able to make this happen, as it's my day off today, which I'm excited about, even though it's never really a day off, as we all know, as those that are self-employed never have a day off. Uh, Sometimes you just got to take one, though, and uh, that ain't today, (laughs) so... But yeah, so we had a fun conversation. Uh, he just got back from Melt as well, so we talked about that and uh, some of the fun happenings out there in the glass community, what inspires his work. He does some really unique stuff uh, in terms of his style and his what he's going for that nobody else is doing, and I think it's really a unique and uh, cool kind of conversation him and I have about the ideas of finding your voice in your work. Um, sometimes it comes from other people, and his inspirations for his work actually came from his girlfriend and uh, it's kind of funny how that works that way. Sometimes you see something one way, some somebody sees it another way, and you end up going that other way. And uh, I think it's 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 a good lesson to learn to not be so focused and blinders up to be able to be open to critique and inspiration from others outside of the glass community and friends, family, you know, whatever. Maybe a movie, a book you're reading, you know, whatever it could be. So something just to take to heart while you're thinking about your work and throughout the day. And I hope you are having a good day, Melton Glass. If you are Melton Glass, while you're working and listening to this, and if not, you're in the car doing some working out, what have you. But uh, yeah, I definitely hope you're enjoying your day and staying hydrated. I know here in Florida, it's still summertime, even though it's officially now fall, but we are going to be cooling down here soon and uh, looking forward to that. Um, kind of some updates on myself. I am him and Han on whether I'm going to be able to make it to Glass Roots. Uh, time-wise, I had the whole week off. It's just come to a financial point. 
<clears throat> with the hurricane coming through, I lost three days of work and uh, as well as had to restock food, fridge, you know, the whole nine yards. And I thought about doing a little, um, I do have um, our Patreon page and I thought about doing a little, maybe a fundraiser to help pay for my trip up there. Uh, it's kind of one of those weird things. I don't like asking for money per se, um, but I don't know if you think that you may want to help donate to the cause to get my ass up to glass roots. Uh, let me know. Uh, just get some feedback on that. It's only two weeks away. Um, they have arrangements made for me, but really it's just getting up there. Um, I do have a wedding I'm going to in Kentucky on the 7th of October. And then my daughter is actually going to be going with me to that. And then she's going to be going with me to glass roots. And it's just, we're going to be driving, uh, from Florida to Kentucky to Madison and then back South. And, uh, so just kind of something I was been thinking in doubt. So I know I've said here several times and I've told many people that we are making it. And then all of a sudden we get a fucking hurricane blows through the state and destroys everything. And so, yeah, kind of put some, some monkey wrenches into my life. But, uh, that being said, um, I'm not asking for handouts or anything like, like that, but I just figured I'd put that out there because again, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while, uh, just to help with helping me in terms of financially do things for the show. Because uh, I do have a lot of dreams and ideas and concepts I want to be able to do, like traveling and doing studio uh, works, like actually going to shops, interviewing the artists in person, uh, doing some video work, some lessons, that kind of stuff. And all that stuff takes money and time. Uh, so I figured I'd put that out there. But I'll keep you all posted. Stay tuned to my Instagram page. Uh, you can find me. My personal Instagram page is at jmichaelglass. The uh, Instagram page for the podcast is at wiseguy underscore radio. And then if you want to see my functional work out there, my functional work page is called at my functionals. Pretty simple. And if you're a glass artist, something to think about. I talked about with Chris Dickey a couple episodes back um, in terms of establishing an online catalog for yourself. And I was blown away that my functionals was actually available. So if you're a glass artist and you already have your glass page, I know everybody likes to put glass at the end of their page, which I can understand and appreciate. But what if you did a separate Instagram page that was just your functional work and actually you pulled all of your functional work off of your personal page? And that way you can show your followers what your life is of like outside the studio. And then you can post teasers here and there, but then have them come follow your other page. You know, some things to think about in terms of marketing and taking advantage of social media, especially now with the ability to switch back and forth amongst accounts. I mean, shit, I have five Instagram accounts right now. I've got one for the podcast. I have one for my personal life stuff. I have uh, my... I have a, one, it's a Disney page that I do. It's my glass. So I used to have it. I, I still do. I don't use it anymore, but it's still there. Um, and then I have one for waffles called Tens to Waffle. And uh, yeah, so and I switch in between all of them all the time. And it's it's can be confusing at times, but it's also gives us the ability to set up different accounts for different aspects of our life that we can share and really focus on one sp specific niche per se, like the waffle thing, for instance, or like doing my functionals page and just showing what my functional art looks like. Um, and because of my personal page being open to the public, also with the dynamic of my job that I have, I really want to just kind of separate my, my functionals from that world in a sense. Um, some may not agree with it, some might, but for myself personally, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while. But also, again, it gives me a chance to have a functional page that I can leave as private. I can also monitor who's in and out of it. And the only people I'm going to be following on that page are shops. And that way I can tag shops and stuff or communicate with the shops a little easier. Especially when you're following, say, like three or 4,000 people on your personal page, it's not always easy to see everybody's feed. So, you know, just some things to think about as I ramble on here about this whole thing. And, uh, you know, just some, some ideas about uh, ways to take advantage of your social media. But in the meantime, uh, don't forget that Mountain Glass is currently offering for the month of September 2017. You can get their Pyrex rod and tube on sale right now, 45% off. <coughs> Excuse me. All you have to do is put in the code Pyrex, P-Y-R-E-X. And that's Pyrex brand glass at checkout. And for all you soft glass, beautiful soft glass nerds out there, they have their double helix sale going on right now. 15% off on double helix glass. Just put in the code D helix at checkout. D H E L I X to receive 15% off. So again, they got Pyrex tube and rod on sale. Just put in the code Pyrex, 45% off. And for double helix uh, rods, 15% off. Put in the code D helix. 
And then as a celebration, also October 29th, 2017, Mountain Glass is having their 15th anniversary party. Uh, they're having a Halloween costume contest. They're having some uh, fun music and raffles and food and glass demonstrations. Uh, it, it is at the uh, Savage Station in Asheville, North Carolina from 6.30 until 10 p.m. So be there or be square. Uh, that's something I'm going to be taking some time off work to go to. It's a little quick drive from my house, 12, 12 hours, and really quick, but it's going to be a fun little drive up there. Get to see all my folks in Asheville, see Joe at Mountain Glass and all the other peeps up there who I love so much. I've been dealing with Mountain Glass for close to 15 years myself. And they are my number one favorite glass distribution company out there in terms of raw materials and supplies. So go check out Mountain Glass, mountainglass.com for any other questions, comments, concerns. And don't forget to get one of their new stickers they have out for their 15-year anniversary. It's a pretty badass little wiggy waggy Mountain Glass sticker. So definitely check that out. Um, yeah, so we got Glass Roots coming up here. Uh, it's coming to be in October which is crazy, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th at Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, and again, I'm going to do my best to get up there, even if we just stay for one or two nights. But um, for those who are going up there, if you would like to be interviewed for this podcast, uh, they have a green room set aside for me that I'm going to be doing in-person interviews. I got all the mics, everything set up for that. Um, just send me a message. Uh, you can send me an email. Actually, it would probably be preferred, honestly. So, um, send me an email. It's uh, wiseguymedia at gmail.com. W-Y-Z-G-U-Y media at gmail.com. I'll put a little link in the show notes. It'll say uh, sign up for interview at Glassroots. And just click on that little link and it'll direct you right to my email and just put in there uh, in the subject interview at Glassroots. And uh, it's going to be fun. I'm going to bring a uh, video in also because I want to do a little bit of video work up there during the interviews. Uh, but if more than anything, uh, ideally, it's just to get these in-person interviews done and take advantage of having uh, lots of artists up there uh, you know, selling their works and what have you. They've got a bunch of workshops going on and classes. It's going to be a lot of fucking fun, and I really need to get make sure I get up there. So whatever it takes, in a sense, to get my ass up there. My daughter, again, is coming up with me, and she's 18 now, so she is... Uh, all about what it is that we all do. And she's a little artist herself, so it's pretty cool stuff. And uh, also, don't forget the Flow Magazine. If you go to theflowmagazine.com and... It, oh my God, I got the hiccups. So let me try this again. And so don't forget uh, also, if you have not yet subscribed to the Flow Magazine, they are offering you 10% off as a new subscriber to their magazine. It's a four-year a publication. Every quarter something new comes out. It's an amazing uh, publication. I've been reading them for years. And there's so many tips and tricks and insights to life and glass in general. Especially if you have a little bit of knowledge of what it is that you're doing, you can read these little step-by-step -step processes and then go out in your shop and try them out. And it's nice to have that paper right there open to look at and as a reference, which I do all the time. Especially when it came to their marbles issue when it uh, had a couple lessons in there about doing compression marbles. Something I've always struggled with and uh, I don't, don't struggle with as much anymore just because I went through the step-by-step -step process of the magazine's lessons. It was pretty badass. Um, they also do a lot of webinars and all kind of fun stuff. So just go to, uh, go to the uh, flowmagazine.com and check them out. And again, if you want the 10% off, just put in the code WISEGUY at checkout, W-Y-Z-G-U-I at checkout, and you'll receive 10% off your purchase for your new subscription. And uh, yeah, and also for all you iPhone users, they just updated the iPhone to iOS 11. Um, even if you have a six or a seven, whatever iPhone you have, or a five even, or the new eight, or the new 10, or the 25, or the X, or whatever the hell they're calling them these days, but they have a new app for the iPhone uh, for your podcast player. And what's interesting is if you go and you open up the podcast on your podcast player for this podcast, I'm going to do it right now as I'm talking to you so I can make sure that this shit works. So you go to your library. If you click on shows, it's going to bring up all your shows that you listen to. You go down to my podcast on there where it says Wise Guy Radio. You open it up. And you'll see what it has is the recent interview or episode on there um, that you haven't fully listened to all the way through. And if you scroll down the page, you will see where it says uh, best of the podcast. It has uh, episodes on there that I believe might have been the most downloaded episodes potentially. Um, but you also can leave a rating now and re reviews. And it'll show a couple of reviews in there. So all you got to do is just scroll down and you can literally just click on the five stars 
And then you can also click on write a review and you can leave me a review, which helps out tremendously. Uh, what it does is it lets iTunes know that the show is being listened to and it puts it up in the ranks for the podcast as well as exposes it to more folks out there in the world who don't have a clue about who we are. And being the Wise Guy Radio Show doesn't have glass in the name. Um, I do have it in the, the little links and the tags and what have you. Um, but it'll give the, again, give the world a chance to really see what this community is all about, how fast we're growing, how we all come together and we all help each other out. It's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. So if you can, leave a review for me. Be kick ass. I am all out of pendants. We officially gave all 40 of them away, which is pretty fucking awesome. So thank you to everybody who uh, sent out a review. And if you have not yet received your pendant for that, please let me know. Um, I had two that were sent out right before Hurricane Irma came through and also another package, which I'm devastated about, but um, that were lost in the mail. And I send these out in a little bubble envelope so I don't do tracking on them because it only costs like $1.50 to ship them. But unfortunately, they were lost, and I don't mind sending out new ones if I have to. So if you did not receive one, you left a review. Of course, I'm going to go and make sure you did do a review and that you're not just lying to me, trying to get a free pendant, which I don't mind doing, but I prefer that you do a little bit of work for it, you know? Okay. So let me know. Hit me up, either through my uh, Instagram page or email, what have you, and uh, I'll have all those links down again down below in the show notes. And I'm going to stop rambling. So you guys enjoy this episode with Topher Marcos, and you can find him online on Instagram at Original Topher. And again, and, and, and I realized at the end of this interview, I said Topher's Originals, which is not what his Instagram page is. I'm a jackass. I'm not going to edit that out, but I, I did say that at the end. <laughs> so it's Original Topher. Check him out. He does some pretty badass stuff. And uh, if you're not familiar with his work, you will be familiar now. So definitely check him out. And until next time, thanks again for tuning in to episode 175 of the Wise Guy Radio Show. And we will see you next week. Talk to you soon. Love you so much. Hey, what's up, Topher? Welcome to the show. Hey, man. How's it going? Pretty good, dude. It's uh, finally hey, getting you on here. To the show. Uh, we were yeah, inter- was- introduced together through uh, the Tournament of Fire here back a couple months back with uh, all those crazy kids and had a lot of fun with that and uh, definitely want to cover that conversation, too, and your experience in it and uh, our little, yeah, you know. I-, I really enjoyed that. That was something different and fun and, yeah, the, I which I did better, but I would definitely try that again. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Same with me, but you know, I'll, I wanna, I'll get into it in here a little bit later on. But timing for myself, it was actually perfect that I didn't move on to the next round. So I got to say, it was. Uh, I'm glad you that you you beat me in that head to head part. <laughs> <laughs> round one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we get too off track here, man, if you want to uh, start us off by giving us your superhero origin story and how you got introduced to the flame. Yeah, um, I was going to college at Rowan University for business, and I took a glass blowing one class, like a soft glass class at Wheaton Village. Um, really liked it, so I started volunteering there, helping take care of the grounds and getting mostly doing like uh, I would speak during the demos while the glass blowers did their thing and got on the furnace in between like lunchtime and stuff, and then. From there, I wanted to learn how to make pipes, obviously, so I uh, took a few lamp working classes, took the ultimate class with uh, Coil, Joe P, Snick, Elbow, WJC, and Shobo. It was a very, very early intro for me, so I was a little bit, you know, out of my element, but I learned a lot of what could be done and then I spent a year after that just focusing on Millie. I took a David Kaminsky class. Um, it was like a, a two-on-one class in New York. And went home, tried to make a couple Millies. Some came out, some didn't. Then he flew out to New Jersey uh, for the IFC and spent a, a week with me and kind of drilled home everything that I was doing wrong and then you know kept practicing and eventually took a carl taylor class 
um, on encasements and so I could learn how to apply my million in my scenes and took uh, I was going to Salem for a while only finished a year of that but um, learned a lot about you know the hollow stuff and mm-hmm. seals and and yeah just been practicing since and getting better Hell yeah. So how, how long into like glass blowing or just the overall art were you till you started taking classes? Um, pretty early on, I, I, uh, during like the first four months, I like, while well, I was still going to business school, I was like, you know, just doing it in the basement off of YouTube videos, Dustin Revere's videos, that, that type of stuff and mm-hmm. whatever information I could find on the melting pot. And, then yeah, eventually I just I took uh, the ultimate class and just realized how much faster you could learn if like you're surrounded by the right instruction and it's you know some of them do get pretty expensive but um, it, with the right te- teachers will you know take care of you like after the class and continue to answer your questions and it is really worth it in the long run. Saves you a lot of time on like, you know, your, your, your own mistakes and just yeah. seeing how other people do their thing. Yeah, I agree, man. That's what I, when I look at the cost of these classes, you're really not, you know, it's, it's an investment and you're paying for the lack of pain you have to deal with for, uh, all the fuck ups you have to go through and don't get me wrong. Oh, you, yeah. still, you still have to go through those fuck ups, but it's so much easier when someone could be like, Hey, just do it this way. Instead of trying yeah, it twenty different times, <laughs> you know? right? Yeah, and even after you see them do it, it like so you like go and do it, and there's still mistakes that mm-hmm. you're gonna make. That if you get to work with that person again, there'll be like a slight adjustment that will make all the difference for you. Yeah, for sure. And I even know like the classes I took recently, like in the last couple of years, they were it was like that for me too. It was kind of a I had to go home and practice it. I mean, I was like, I was ready to go home right away after everything I learned and go, you know, it took me probably three days to get a chance to get on the torch again. But, you know, getting, having that knowledge and background understanding where you can actually take notes that you can bring home and really understand the notes you're taking, you know, and use that for references and, you know, all that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. It's so, it's so important to journal and, and keep a log of all the stuff that you're doing, you know, whether it's formulas, recipes, materials you're using, you know, names for yeah, techniques. Especially when you're as forgetful as most of us are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I want to kind of go back up to the business school thing. So did you actually, did you go through the process and complete your degree in, uh, in business itself? I, I did. I finished my, uh, I got my degree in entrepreneurship and minored in management. Um, it definitely helps me. And I try to remember all the stuff I learned from back then and apply it to my business. But I have only just begun, like, you know, being better about, uh, you know, records and um, gonna like just registered my like myself as an LLC and all that good stuff. Cool. Yeah, I was also kind of wondering if there was like any specifics that you took out of that class or out of your schooling that you you found that you can now take into glass because you know the glass business isn't like it's a huge thing unless you have a full studio and employees and whatever, but you know, as a solo yeah. player, per se. Yeah. I mean, basically just like the, the attitude about it is like every entrepreneur is just really passionate about what they do. And most of us are very passionate about class. and you just have to, you know, things get tough and you just got to keep going. Yeah. I think the things I've learned most from the business classes I've taken is to really treat your business as its own entity and that you're just an employee of that entity in a sense, even though you own it or what have you. But it helps you kind of like understand that when you're going and get a sale that you can't just go and just spend all that money because all you're doing is stealing from your business in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're representing, yeah. yeah, Like you said, it's a separate entity rather than just yourself. And Yeah. yeah, it's important to remember that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. So part of your gig I've, I've, I've noticed too, is a lot of, you have like a lot of music that you use in your work and is, is music like a, has it been an influential part of your life in a sense of, you know, art wise, or is it just something that you just kind of do for fun? Um, yeah, I mean, I played musical instruments growing up, uh, piano, guitar, and I mean, I slacked off, uh, in high school, which I regret now, but 
trying to get back on the keyboard a little bit, but, but obviously I, you know, listen to music. Mm-hmm. I love, love music. And, but yeah, that was kind of, I love the music stuff. It's like a, an exciting series to work on and, Music hasn't been like a, a huge, huge role, but definitely an important role in my life. Well, do you find though that like from the past music that you have taken like class wise or whatever that it helped to kind of, I guess, expedite your techniques with glass? Because it's, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how long does it take you to learn how to blow glass? I'm like, well, how long does it turn, like, turn to learn to, to play the guitar? You know, it's like, yeah, either I mean, you can, you can play a guitar, learned, but learned learned a lot of lessons about like, persistence and just like being frustrated but continuing anyway and yeah just practice yeah man like practicing your scales you gotta practice yeah. making balls of glass and pulling points or whatever <laughs> exactly yeah so what were some of the first things you started making off the bat um you know try i like like many newcomers i just wanted to make a mini rig and like made a bunch of bad rigs so but from there, I like when I like took a break to learn how to make Millie. It like taught me a lot too about just like working with glass. And then when I went back to the hollow, it like kind of came way way faster. Yeah, and I'm sure um, you're working the so, Millie too because you're learning how to work a lot of heat as well and that yeah, big mass heat, of shit. Heat base, keeping it hot, and yeah. It's you, you get to like kind of be a little rougher with the millie. And you got to, you know, obviously baby all the hollow stuff. The millies you can drop and knock around and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So lear- learning to be a little more gentle. Yeah, it's just there's so much work involved. I mean, well, I guess with the millie stuff though, like what when you're doing yours, like what style are you, are you doing? But like the stringer stacks, or are you doing like you doing like a build up? Like no, what? I I do I do all Francini painting yeah just uh start start with you know like the core of my image and work my way out from there cool multi-components yeah i try and like get a lot of detail in there yeah i can i can appreciate that because like the stringer stack stuff i i think it's such a great concept and yeah it's time consuming but it's i i do have more of an appreciation i think for that uh that other tech it's frenchini is that what it's called yeah frenchini would be yeah. like the classic like painting style right. it's a whole another level level of patience to stack the stringers um you know i just learned learned the french way i loved it i love the kind of like organic feel of it mm-hmm. rather than the pixelated you get with the stringer stacks yeah i'm in the same I mean, boat but some of the images that like people could pull off with the stringer stacks are amazing like the portraits like all look, look really good in stringer stacks mm-hmm. yeah man when you, well, so what kind of torch did you first start working on um when i first got behind the torch i was renting time at carlisle and i was also at salem at that time so i learned a lot on a carlisle but uh at the end of business school i like uh, my senior year project was to build like a an elevator pitch. They called it. Mm-hmm. It was like a you have to pitch your business, and like we basically set up this little startup, and there was this whole competition. We won like five grand from it, and between me and a partner, so nice. I used that money mm-hmm. and got myself a Mirage, and and yeah, still have the Mirage. Hell yeah. Yeah, and for those that aren't familiar with the elevator pitch, the idea is that if you're on in an elevator with somebody influential that you want to, you know, propose something to, you only have like maybe 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds to pitch your whatever it is, since you have the opportunity right. to be stuck in a room with somebody for that long, and it's just to be able to get out. You know, somebody's like, "Hey, like, you know, you're at a party, like, well, so what do you do for a living?" You know, kind of thing, but a little bit I more. I got this idea, and you have to be able to present. Like, yeah. you know, we did the whole thing, like start, like the full startup inventory, like for like what you would actually do in the first year of a business. We actually did register it. And, but yeah, you have to learn how to condense all that down into like that 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not easy to do. It's like taking your biography and making it, you know, a two sentences or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not always the easiest We're, to do. I'm sure. 
I went a little over that too. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! What was the business that you guys that you were pitching? Um, we I was like really into aquaponics at the time. I had like this big setup in my kitchen. Cool. Um, my college apartment kitchen. Um, so we came up with like a well little startup kit that like people could clip onto their fish tank to just turn into like a little herb garden and. Yeah, the whole idea of aquaponics is that it uses um, the fish waste and the ammonia in the water to turn it into nitrates and food for the plants. So we built, yeah, like a little mini system that would clip onto like a small, like hobby aquarium and turn it into a little herb garden or something just to like introduce the idea was the whole pitch. That's a great idea. Did you guys take that any further? Like, actually, have a product that you could sell? Um, we built a prototype, and you know, after we won the money, and <laughs> like I, I graduated, my partner still had one more year, but yeah. we registered it. We considered like pursuing it. There were like some problems in the idea that we like kind of brushed over because we're like oh, it's a business competition, we could, like, you know, cover cover the problems or whatever. But right. I think basically the reason why people don't do that is because they're a little clip-on thing like that would get way too much light and uh, produce too much algae, and it wouldn't be enough to actually filter a tank. Okay. Um so yeah, we we decided that, and you know, I wanted to blow glass, so I was like, I'm trying to do that. Yeah, exactly. You're not going on a Shark Tank yeah. anytime soon. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it was fun. It was a good learning experience, and it got me my torch. So cool. Is it something that you're still into, like in terms of the, the aquaponics stuff? Um, I I've been living in Philly for the past three years, and I just moved out to New York and I have more space so I still have my tank and I've been yeah just got my shop finished up so I'm, I've been planning to set up nice uh, uh yeah a little little system sometime soon yeah that's fun whenever uh Epcot has their food and wine and flower and garden shows they always have a big setup like that with like tilapia or something in the bottom and of course they have like you know balls of the walls the best kind of gimmick you can have but uh it's always fun to see that kind of kind of concept and to educate those around because a lot of folks don't really understand about it you know and it's it's a it's a smart way to to, to do things especially if you can yeah, use, use the fish to eat as well yeah it's becoming becoming a little more well known people are hearing about it and it's pretty it's a cool concept that i hope people explore more yeah yeah i agree yeah these are the kind of conversations i like to have on the show too it's just like i love the glass talks but it's always fun to talk about things that are going on outside of the torch and outside the studio you know, because we're all we're all apt to want to share all of our glass, glass, glass all day. But it's fun to see for you know cats and dogs and pets and kids yeah, and yeah. you know the gardens and whatever else going on. So I'm glad you brought that up. The stuff that actually provides the inspiration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So uh, yeah, so after you decided that you couldn't make rigs or you didn't, that they were shit, you know, did you jump back and start doing like hand pipes and some smaller yeah. stuff? Yeah, I like. Never really got too good at like the fast, high quantity proto stuff, and that's something that I do regret. That I have learned a lot of stuff from like going back to make a couple Sherlock's, and um, yeah, if if I could go back, I would definitely do a better job of like focusing on spoons in the beginning, and then which I did do, but you know the whole time i was just like eagerly trying to get to the next part or, and could have spent a little more time on the, the foundations but when i went back to salem you know they drill that stuff um while we and all that stuff and yeah that kind of helped cover for some of my slacking in the beginning right We're, and you weren't taking a pipe class at salem was it was it just like a no no i just took the regular uh scientific glass yeah and yeah dennis brining was my professor okay he's a really cool guy hell yeah so are you doing any kind of scientific work at all now or is it all just stuff you went there for the knowledge 
Uh, yeah, I just went there for the knowledge, the background. Um, yeah, I I was living in Philly while I was going there. So by the second year, I feel like I had gotten what I wanted out of it and kind of stopped going. But yeah, yeah. so I don't know if I could get a scientific position, but um, I know plenty of people who did go that route and they seem they're they're killing it. Yeah, it's an interesting the dynamic to see that to see some you know the, some of the pipers in our industry that are in the scientific realm and they're kind of crossing over to do pipes and or they go back and forth or they just use the scientific glass blowing as a way to you know help support their habit in a sense <laughs> for the glass yeah. pipes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? so it's a it's a steady job that is also blowing glass. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, that's always how I kind of film with my gig over at, at the mouse house is the same way. It's just helping. Oh yeah, helping, yeah you, you, know, you got that going su- on. Support my habit in a sense, even though it's a lot. I get I get way more out of it than just that, but still, it's it's the consistency which is fantastic. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, so you're, you're, you still yeah. get to blow glass while you're. Yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so weird right now too. Like, have I just had a uh, my buddy Chris Dickey on? We were talking about just the dynamic of this industry right now and how there's a lot of artists that are well established artists that are struggling right now because of this. And I can't say it's an oversaturation because I think there's more smokers and users of glass than there are makers of it. But still, there seems to be this weird oversaturation of something going on. I don't know if it's like lack yeah. of price regulations or what, but it's pretty crazy to yeah, see, I man. Think- yeah, it, there's it's definitely an interesting time right now, and you know it's like people like every day you go on Instagram, somebody you've never heard of, like some like crazy ass piece or something. You're like, you know, this guy's got like 500 followers or something, or like mm-hmm. a thousand followers, and they're like, there uh, there's a lot of really talented people, and you know, it's it's good. I think as long as you try and like continue to do like do your own thing in a way that makes you stand out somehow yeah exactly and that's that that i was yeah. thinking about that today because like i have a catalog i've been wanting to put back out there but i'm like you know my catalog is a lot of the shit i did like eight eight ten years ago and it's all stuff that i could, I could know i could sell now just production stuff but it's like it would kind of i feel it would just get mixed in with everybody else's stuff and you know my my personal line my wise guy line stands out just because that's my thing but like it's hard to figure yeah, it's rec- out, you know. Recognizable, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But to do an actual like production line that isn't like my brand or something like that isn't always the easiest thing to get out and get going. And like I have a student yes. who I've been helping for a while now, and he was he's been getting super frustrated for like the last year because his sales were sucking. And I'm like, dude, you got to understand, it's like your brand fucking new. This is not a, ma- a sprint. This is a marathon. Just keep what you're doing and keep practicing. Keep practicing. And he had a huge breakthrough like two weeks ago, and he's finally starting to get some good size orders coming in. I mean, he's he lined up more orders in a week than he's had in six months, and they're still coming in. And it's just like, you know, you got to get. Yeah. It's that point of frustration where you're like, I'm about to give up, but I know I shouldn't. And then once you don't give up and you break through it, you succeed. Yeah, it's, there's you know ups and downs all along the way, but you just got to keep at it and. But yeah, it feels good when it starts picking up. Yeah, exactly. Do you find that your uh, your business school like gave you any tools though per se for like understanding about having like a squirrel fund and saving during the slow times and you know setting you know uh, setting up those kind of things for yourself? An understanding of it, probably. That in practice, I'm not the best <laughs> at it, but <laughs> but yeah, I I try and you know. It's hard to resist the urge. There's always like tools and stuff you want, and mm-hmm. like some of it's worth it, some of it's not. Colors, same deal. Some of it's worth it, some of it's not. But you know, as long as you feel like you're spending it on the right stuff and reinvesting it into yourself, and not, you know, partying with it too much or anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the main try, thing. Yeah. yeah, try not to to you know focus on the money too much. Obviously, it's important and necessary to do what we do. But if you only made stuff towards like you know how much you could sell it for, like I feel like I put 
more work into some of my pieces than it, I know it's going to sell for, but it's, I don't know. I feel like sometimes if you focus too much on the bottom line, you could lose some of the artistic value. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I agree. That, I, think I try and remember. Yeah, but go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I think that's what separates the the art from the craft, you know, with the, when it comes exactly. to the pipes. Yeah. So some, sometimes I like consciously know that I'm not making the best business decision. And a lot of times it's while I'm making a certain milli or something, but um, it's still, it like, it, I think is important to like not let it get stale or old or like feel like work or anything like that. If, you know, if it gets boring at all, you could lose some of your creativity. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's why I like to watch movies and listen to books on tape and stuff for those times that do get boring. Because you know, there's not always, not always the creative side of, of making pipes. Sometimes you got to put that creativity aside and just bust out production. You know, and a be, bunch of prep or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pulling stringers or points or whatever. But even like doing milli work, dude. I mean, there's you know, there's a ton of prep and involvement in that of just the preparation before you even turn your torch on. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Image, image prep, and that's one of the things Kaminsky drives home is like image selection, like. No matter how good you are at making milli, you pick the wrong image, and it, you know sometimes will just won't look right in a milli. Yeah, yeah. So, what's your process for that? Like in terms of picking out your image or figuring out what the hell you're gonna do? Um. So recently, I've been you know working on the scenes, but uh, before that, we did a lot of like hand drawn stuff. We were like kind of like fine some cartoon cartoonish images and then like tweak them from there um my girlfriend draws a lot of my milk images for me she's nice. like a good do- doodler but yeah uh basically just limit the amount of components or if you want a lot of detail i try and like you know break it down into bigger components and size it up and build all the components and i like I'm just constantly referencing my final image as I build the components to like keep it all in proportion, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, that's a lot of work. That's why I say, like, I, I haven't had the... I mean, I can't say I haven't had the time, but I haven't had the time <laughs> to, to invest in the milli work. Yeah. Like, you know, like, my brother's been doing milli work for about a year now, and his, his, he's doing more, like, abstract uh, mosaic stuff, but his work is fucking incredible. I mean, it looks like a sheet of blotter acid, you know, type stuff. And uh, cool, yeah. it's just fucking amazing that what he's do- like, please blow my mind what he's doing out there and rolling them nice. up and, you know, into a tube and then adding them to his, his rigs and stuff. And he's told me he'll spend two weeks on something and he, you know, he sells it for a good amount of money, but it still doesn't pay for the entire amount of time that he's put into it. And again, it's, he's not doing De- it for the money. Yeah. He's doing it because his appreciation and love for it. Yeah, I, yeah, I know that feeling. But yeah, like I said, when it's when you care about it like that, it's easy. You just like kind of just do it, and you know whatever it sells for. If it sells, it's cool. And then if it sells for more, it's even cooler. Yeah, exactly. Do you try to set like a minimum though? Like if it doesn't, if you can't get a certain amount for it, you'll just hold on to it, type of thing. Oh yeah, definitely. But uh, um, I like trying like. I have like a certain amount that I like for each of my milli sections. And then, you know, if it's like more intricate or like I've been doing like specific songs and if it's like the amount of bars that the milli section is, I try and like price it according to that. And yeah, it's been, like I said, like I've been recently like re-examining all the business side of things and trying to, you know, get, get all that stuff sorted out, like, uh, better pricing strategy and more consistent, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. 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 Cause that's the, that, I think that's the biggest thing to any success is just being consistent. Yeah, right. You know, whatever it is, whether it's losing weight or, and, or eating the right food or, you know, being a glass blower. Yeah. Just the habits and consistency. And as you get better at blowing glass, I feel like I've been like, able to nail the same shapes and it's like easier for me to categorize my things and it like all kind of builds upon itself Mm -hmm. 
for me. Well, I want to go back to the music thing that you mentioned. Are you, so when you're doing your Millie scenes, like with the music, are you actually creating like sheet music of a song? Y- yeah. So my proto line, I've been doing like uh, key signatures, like uh, scales, different like majors and minors. And for the other tubes, I've been doing, yeah, like um, usually just a bar or two bars of the chorus for each song I pick. That's fucking, um, that's fucking cool, man. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I just like, you know, either print it out or find it on my phone. And I have like, I spent like uh, maybe like two months making like a a note a night. Like I would make a, a pipe and a Sherlock or something like my daily routine and then a milli at, at the end of the night. Because like those are pretty simple milli as far as like, you know, the other milli I've been making, which mm-hmm. is like multi component, all this detail. And these are just like, you know, some of them have like this kind of complex shapes, but nothing too difficult. So I was able to just like crank one out at night, and then eventually I had like a good stash of notes. And um, I had a good friend, and when I lived in Philly, that would you know help me cut up and polish all this stuff. And it's you know I just moved out of Philly, so it's been a little tougher like doing all the cutting and polishing myself, but. Mm-hmm. Um, that's I, I would say is the biggest time suck is the polishing. Yeah, that's a fun idea though. It's like I know myself. Like in the back in the day, there was times where I was like listening to some music, and I'm like, man, it'd be great to do a whole series of pipes or whatever that was based on this inspiration from this particular song I'm listening to, or like you know Pink Floyd's The Wall or something of that nature, you know, and just you know yeah, call been, that line that you know in a sense. Yeah, it's been a fun way to approach things. Um, I think it's, it's genius, like, dude. especially. Oh, thank you. Uh, Especially when I'm like collabing with people, it's like kind of fun to like try and think of a song that correlates with whatever like the theme of their work is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it it usually makes it like a little more fun. So, are you doing them as an encasement, or are you doing like a tube roll up with them when you're doing the sheet music? I I sleeve sleeve everything. Yeah. Still, man, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> Such a cool idea. Well, thanks. And then you thanks. get into, like, I've seen your post with your music boxes that you're doing with your cases, so you want to tell us about that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just even I've done crazier. A couple of... <laughs> oh, thanks. I've done a couple of those. I basically just get a little sound module, like the... Basically the ones that are inside the greeting cards that you open and uh-huh. play the little song. And, yeah, you can just buy them online. Um record the song onto it and then like whatever song the piece is stick it in the pelican and when i first did it i like rigged it so that as soon as you would open it it would play the song but then i thought like maybe that could get annoying if like every time you open or close your pelican like you're going back in there to get a banger or something yeah small world comes on or some shit (laughs) yeah like (laughs) over and over so yeah so then i just put a little tab in there that you know it if for the novelty of it, if you want to play play the song, yeah, yeah, it's a cool and, thing though, man. Because like, I, I don't know, is anybody else doing that? I mean, maybe people will do it now that they're hearing this shit, but like, um, hopefully, I not. Mean, hopefully so. That, that'd be cool. <laughs> I think it's and great. There are there are a few problems I've run into it. So if anybody you know does it and figures out the problems that I've had, it would be cool if they shared back. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but. Yeah, it is fun. It's a, another element that you get to add to the piece. So I yeah, try and yeah, add as much as I can. I've been trying to include a seven inch vinyl as well with every piece, but that's become a little bit of a challenge and I've spent a little more money on vinyls than I'd like. Yeah, I'm sure. To find the specific vinyl. Are you having them pressed and, or are you actually like going out and finding the actual vinyl? Oh, no, I've been like, uh, well, at first I was like, I would make a song I really wanted to make onto a piece. And then I would like go online and spend like two days searching through like, or like going to different record stores. And then I've, since then I started getting the vinyl first with whatever vinyls I can find and making those pieces according to like what vinyls I already have rather than trying to like go out and search for a specific one. Hmm. Yeah, man, time is money. Oh, exactly. (laughs) And also, when you go into those old record stores, you can get up for a dollar or two dollars. When you're looking for a specific one, people are like 20 bucks or whatever. And, you know, by the time you buy a Pelican and a 
sound module and the vinyl and the, all this time into the piece itself like you know you obviously add that on to the price of the piece but mm-hmm. you know got to keep things affordable for everybody yeah yeah man but the, the nostalgia and the whole concept of what you're doing is like a marketing package i think is incredible it's super smart because like you're saying you can do a little couple accessories on the side that have the same notes of that match and it's a great idea yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been a fun concept to explore. What was the inspiration for all that? Was it your background in music, or was it just like I'm, I'm not gonna guess? What, uh, what was your inspiration? <laughs> <laughs> not so much. My girlfriend uh, helped me come up with the idea. Basically, it, I like took the Carl Taylor class. Was like trying to plan out. I was doing a lot of fish scenes after that, mm-hmm. and that was just um, made like a bunch of fish milly with my shop mate, uh, Glass Monkey. He's like really into uh, fish and aquariums, so it was like fun to explore that concept. And we had a bunch of fish millies, so I like made some seaweed and some other like underwater millies, and made some of those scenes for a while. And then the whole cadmium scare came around, and um, I was like, you know, stocked up on what I could because you know one image I like needs a pound of yellow or something, and it like. Became, it was, you know, I was questioning what millies I could make. So I was like trying to think of a millie scene that wouldn't require much or any cadmiums in it. And yeah, somehow we were talking and she came up with the sheet music. I started out, I was actually uh, wrapping flat cane just black and clear flat cane to make the five lines around a white blank and then she was like oh why don't you just spin up back a vac stack and um it's just way easier to do it that way (laughs) it's so funny man when you have somebody outside that really doesn't know glass that can tell you something like that you know it's (laughs) It's yeah, a, it's yeah, it's a almost diff- a different perspective. Yeah, totally, dude. Because I mean, I love that. Yeah. Like, I've mentioned it before on the show. Like, I love when I'm making something, and I'm going one direction, and a friend will come by, and he's like, "Hey, you making this?" I'm like, "No, but I will now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, totally. Well, like, hey, hey actually, let me I need to hit pause real quick, bro. I need to get my phone charger and plug my phone in real quick so it doesn't die on us. Oh yeah, no yeah, problem. Give me one sec. Okay, cool. But uh, yeah. So, anyways, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off there. Oh, you're good. But yeah, man, I, th- I think I think it's such a cool cool thing to have someone. I mean, not only a girlfriend, but even you know, just a friend or whatever, just to give you those kind of inspirations and can see the different perspectives. Because it's so easy to get like so. What's the word I'm looking for? Like having your you, like, bl- your blinders up. Things or like yeah, you know, totally. You get lost in a certain thought or process, and I'm like, you know, just discovered the sleeving thing at that that point and i just wanted to sleeve everything and he's like oh I'll <laughs> sleeve flat cane and sleeve millie over that and it, it just became fun and but yeah like efficiency and you know it's just easier and more accurate yeah yeah than absolutely. faster to do it the other way yeah so have you taken this concept of like the with the music and sheet notes and is it just strictly on rigs because you have like a good canvas size canvas to do them on um, I've made, I've made, uh, some Sherlock's and a couple jars and a, a big cup with my shop mate Casta. Um, it has been a little tough for me to get them, like to size them down real small. And I've tried to make a couple pendants, but between like the viscosity issues of the white and black and then the black millies or like the thickness over the black lines, it they become a little difficult to even out and switching axes i've you know distorted a bunch of sections Mm -hmm. so i'm still kind of work working on how to like manipulate these sections a little better because they are a little tough to work with then sometimes i feel bad handing them off to people because (laughs) it takes you know a second to like I don't know, even it all out. It's kind of, kind of something I'm working on right now. Yeah. 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 It makes sense though, man, because you have a lot of layers going on and it's not always easy to, to make it consistent. Well, for instance, like my student, he's wanting to learn how to do like a, how, how Nate does his uh, Swiss perks. 
and he just wanted to do like a little small one because he's been getting into doing donuts and stuff. So I made him a big fat patty, basically like eight inches long, out of some forty four uh-huh. last week. And he's he's I was talking to him yesterday, and he was he was all he wanted to do was put five holes in it, and just keep it consistent and even and simple. And I didn't realize when I made the piece that the wall thickness wasn't a hundred percent consistent all the way around the whole piece because I actually flattened out the sides. You know, like I left it oval but flattened it out so it was easier to work with. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that process by doing that, it kind of moves some of the glass around a little bit. So he's like, "Yeah, I got the first three down, but the last two, I fucked up that that the walls weren't touching." I'm like, "Yeah, it's probably because it wasn't completely consistent all the way through," and that was something he, you know, he didn't even contemplate even thinking about that because he is new at this, you know. So it's those kind of things that you really got to think about when you're going to do like a build. Like when I took I took that Joe Peters Peter Muller class, they kept referring to like them their moves that are making this next move and I was kind of like I've heard that before but not really in the glass world and it made so much sense cuz it's it is you're like making these little chess moves and these you got to really think like four or five moves ahead of yeah, what's yeah, it going to do. Yeah, steps ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and that I mean that's where the experience comes in of them, you know, doing it so many times and they're just like they know what problems to expect and what to prepare for and what, you know, what things to plan for. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, it kind of reminds me the other day I was on stage making pumpkins and we've been trying to make an eight inch pumpkin and it's, getting to a point where I was like, I think I need to get three gathers to make this thing myself personally. Cause my, I'm, I'm still working on getting a nice first gather, much less a second and third. So yeah. I get my third gather. It's, I get, you know, it's all going well. And then the whole time I've been dealing with the injured wrist for like the last two weeks. So it wasn't really, it wasn't helping me at all, but it was still, I just had to power through it. But, uh, I got all my, I got my setup, everything done. I got my bubble all moved through and I go into my optic mold to blow into, to get that pumpkin texture on the outside. And I go, I put my, I got it out. I get it on my bench. I have a bunch of people watching me, and I go to put my blow hose on, and I'm blowing through air through it just to make sure I'm sealed up, and I'm, I'm feeling air not, you know, moving through my hose. I'm like, fuck, I got a hole in my hose somewhere. I'm like thinking to myself. So I sit at the bench, and I go to like, uh, basically go to do my jack line, and I realize that the bottom of the fucking pumpkin had actually popped open inside the mold because it was my bubble was too far down and it was, it was too thin. Airtight, yeah. You know, so it just popped in the bottom inside the mold. And I had no idea because it's such a long piece of glass I'm working with. So I was like, oh shit. So I was just, I told the guests, I'm like, you know, so I, I am a lamp worker. I know how to take a piece of tubing and marver it down on a piece on a table and close it back up. So, I, but it was such a quick thought. It made me ha- happy to think that I'm, like, I was able to, to come up with that that quickly. Because I was able to go back in my heater, I reheated that bitch back up, went to my table, marbled it down, went to my bench, got my diamond shears out, closed that fucker right back up as much as I could, and came out with a really nice pumpkin at the end of the, pro- the end of the process. And yeah, I know, like yeah, you uh, know, early on, I probably would have just tossed it in my bucket and started over again. Right. Yeah. It's it's really cool to see uh, like soft glass and lamp working the two worlds merge, and it is like. I was just at Melt, and Marcel had like his whole Boro furnace there, and it was just uh, really cool to see like all like the techniques, especially like first starting out in the soft glass world, like a lot of us did, and seeing it applied to Boro or vice versa. Like you're saying, your technique of like closing down a tube in soft glass, and how a lot of soft glass people have been making some crazy sculptures recently and mm-hmm. it is cool to see the, the two worlds merge kind of yeah 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 bro it, it blows my fucking mind when i see marcel get a huge gather or go come out of his glory hole <laughs> with this big mass of boro and you know that shit's got to be close to four thousand degrees and he's not wearing any protection except for his hat and a pair of fucking sleeves <laughs> i'm like waiting for him to catch on fire i'm like dude what the f-? like it's it's just he's just a he's just on his world of his own with what he's doing it's just incredible yeah, he's a g He's also got the coolest hat on in the room. Yeah, so totally, sure always. <laughs> 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 but even like their whole concept with their whole with their like the currency that they're making and stuff, it's just a neat. Oh, I, dude, it was so know. cool seeing like watching the way they work as a unit, and uh, it was just really, really something to see. It was like hopped in there. They had me pull down a couple couple letters, and resize some stuff. It was like cool to be a part of it for a quick second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how was Melt? I've been I've actually the first person I've had a chance to talk to that went. Oh, it was unbelievable. It was like obviously like nothing you've ever been to. It's like the 
environment was great. The uh, like everybody was so nice to each other, open and sharing. Like it was, it was like I can't wait till next year. Uh, I don't know really what else is like the best experience. It was like summer camp for glass blowers and yeah. basically feel like a little kid the whole time. The food was amazing and it was like everything was so it was like you know their, for their second year very few problems and they had went through a crazy amount of like tanks and they barely had any downtime as far as like swapping tanks and like it was i don't know it was really cool like 150 glass blowers or something like all with their torches and Hmm. Very yeah. It, Covington had like their saw and lap wheel. There were lathes and furnaces. Greasy and Monkey were pulling color there. Yeah, it was just like yeah, glass blowers paradise pretty much. Yeah, it sounds a guy like with a, a soft glass truck like uh, from Philly. He has like a little soft glass mobile studio, and he was out there. Anybody could hop in there if they want. And it, yeah. Too cool. Did it you get? Was, did you get a bench space for yourself? I did. I was able to. I made a rig the first night, and then I was. I made a component for that milli that Dapo made um, for the event itself. Um, a couple of his students also made a milli, and Micro made a component for it, and so that was cool to like all hop in on a milli. Yeah. Um, then made another milieu with my friend Phil, uh, of uh, and then yeah, so it was re- it was just really cool to be able to like start a bunch of projects with different people. I like, handed out a bunch of my sections to people to take home with them, and um, you know, started conversations with people and planned future collabs and trips and the networking there and like the people you meet and yeah. It, it was just I can't wait to go back. Yeah, it's a cool dynamic with our industry, man. It just has the culture of the pipe makers. It's just like we're just this one big happy community and family, and everybody for the most part gets along. I mean, you got your trolls and your a holes out there. Don't get me wrong, but oh yeah, I mean you know they're everywhere, and even even like you know anywhere you go, you just got to be prepared for that type that you know mm-hmm. thing. But it is cool when you're somewhere where the majority of people are nice and respectful and it was just a really really amazing week yeah i gotta get salt on here to talk about next year for sure because uh is he is he what's that doing next year i don't know i don't know because i know he was involved in it last year was he there just this year i don't think he was there this year um do you know who's who all's putting that thing on do you know like who's the the main backers behind it yeah, um, Paul Catherman, uh, Josh Mazette, okay. Kevin Beecher. Uh, I'm trying to remember any other names. Uh, I know Blake, uh, I can't always butcher his last name, Levikinoff, Donso Glass. Yep. Um, he has recently started helping out a lot. Uh, Stellar helps out. But yeah, mainly Josh um, and Paul and Kevin. Hell yeah. Is it on their property yeah. that they have up there, or is it like some rented space? It, it's a rented, like rented spot, same place they had it last year. It's a summer camp for kids, and um, there's a bunch of cabins on it. Each cabin has bathrooms, showers, a bunch of beds, and then there's like you know a cafeteria. They set up like two big torch tents. Uh, and yeah, it was it was really really well put together. Uh, the food was like I ate really good there. Hell yeah, that's the best. And <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, what more can you ask for, man? Some fucking glass blowing and some great food and good times like that. It's like yeah. it was it was pretty. I guess the the one thing which uh, they had some trouble with uh, electricity, which. I guess they, they, I mean, they had generators going the whole time, but I guess uh, with all the furnaces running, they blew a transformer the first night. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So there's, that was a little incident, but they had it all sorted out by the second day. 
Yeah, that's that is yeah. the one thing you got to deal with is all that electricity. We're some yeah, so electricity using fools. Yeah, so that you know gives some restrictions as far as like they have to cut you off at some point at the night. I think it was like three a.m. most nights, so it wasn't like early or anything. But with, you know, if you're in the habit of working late or like mealies, I like usually end up you know starting late in the night and working through the night or whatever, just because it's like a long process that you don't really want to stop in the middle mm-hmm. of. So you just got to be like prepared for that type of stuff and. I don't know. Maybe bring bring your own kiln. I would say I might want to bring my own kiln next year. Well, that's a good thing to know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure they are growing. Obviously, it's their second year, so th- a lot of this stuff that they're renting, they're also like you know buying as they go along. So they're adding more kilns and all that stuff as they go. So and it's. I can imagine not an easy thing to organize. No way. But it, they did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's it's a cool thing to see this these new kind of events coming out because, you know, with, with AGI going on for years and years and years and then coming to a halt for a while, now they're back up and running again. And, you know, Joe Peters had their summer camp, the, what was it, like, want to make a heady or something like that, they called it. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's fucking hilarious you know yeah, just, yeah you know just some fun shit like it's it's just a cool thing going on it's and it seems like the areas that that really hold the, the a lot of the glass blowers at are like areas that are just gorgeous weather and environment and you know like in florida we could do it here but it had to be in like april or something like that when it's not so fucking hot yeah yeah it, i heard some rumors about a west coast melt i think that i don't, I don't think it's anything solid but right something people are interested in that would be cool to take a trip out yeah 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 exactly yeah because like the, yeah, DFO the more is not... these things oh go on i was just saying the more of these things that pop up the cool like you know the more things we get to go to yeah 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 and the more money to invest in yourself and take classes and grow as a community yeah exactly That's cool do you so speaking of that do you do any trade shows at all I do do trade shows. Um, I did Glass Roots last year. I've done, um, yeah, I guess, Glass Roots twice. Um, not too many, but I am working on building, you know, more of an inventory rather than just letting everything go. I've participated in like a couple of like shows, which is fun as far as like gallery shows. Um, those are cool because you get to like you know make a piece with some meaning behind it and submit it for for an event. Yeah, yeah. So with those the shows that you did, were you there was like invites or were they like call to, call out to artists kind of things? Um, both. Uh, I did. Uh, Ruckus did a call call to a submission. And we, me and my shop mate Casta made like a Jaws themed piece with cool. like some, some Jaws Millie and a boat. Uh, I mean, some fish Millie around like a boat. And it was like this crazy piece. It was fun to make. Um, and then, yeah, they also had a non functional show there. And I submitted a few pieces in that. Um, there's another show coming up at Spectra Art in Colorado. They're having like an all vinyl theme show. And um they asked me to be a part of it which should be fun i'm gonna try and make you know a couple pieces pertaining to certain vinyls and yeah got a come up with a plan of action for that but that okay. should be fun that's october 7th cool i'm seeing the uh the melt millie right now oh nice yeah i made that little bushy looking tree hell yeah that's cool. Uh, yeah. Dapo was uh, somebody I spent a lot of the week with. He's really cool and has a lot of good information. And he's going to try and go to California one, one day to work with him. Heck yeah. Yeah, if you guys go check out his uh, Topher's Instagram, it's at Original Topher. I'll have that link in the show notes. You can see his work and see what we're talking about here with the Millie Chips. It's pretty cool stuff. Thank pretty, you. pretty cool stuff. Yeah, man. So yeah. I want to bring up the uh, way you and I were first introduced, which was the tournament of fire, and uh, you know it was uh, 
definitely it was a lot of fun. It was a new thing for myself. I know it was new for you too. And, uh, you know, you and I happened to be uh, paired together as the head to head. And what was it like eight <laughs> votes or some shit? Like it was so close. <laughs> oh, it was so close. Uh, I, I, yeah. My, the second round was just as close. You know, it was too much anxiety. <laughs> But yeah, I was I was pretty nervous when I saw I was matched up against you first, and uh, yeah, I like made a millisection at first that broke, which is how I ended up with that little section of sheet music for the stand. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so I just like repurposed that, made that little um, treble clef oney. And yeah, that was like a new thing that I was like wanted to explore more. Actually, the tournament of fire was like the first time I blew glass, and I had just went to Australia for my cousin's wedding. Um, and before that, I was on another trip, and then I I was moving when I got back, and it was just like a whole bunch of stuff. So I hadn't blown glass in like a month and a half, and then. They hit me up about the tournament of fire, and I was like, "Well, oh, that's a perfect excuse to like get something going immediately, and, like set up a little table, like in in a horse barn, and just like got to, you know, explore some of the ideas that I was thinking of during the month that I was in blind glass." Yeah, this, so that that one was it hollow, like every connection all the way through the entire piece. Yeah. Yeah, everything's hollow on that. Cool. Yeah, it was a fun little piece. Yeah, it was kind of interesting, man, because I, th- I thought that what was cool, like the way that Cherry Glass put everything on, was it really like gave us all a chance to get our shit together when it comes to social media and broadcasting live every day and talking to your followers and really getting a grasp on what it means for the trueness of social media and, and being social. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, like the first time I've ever really done anything like that. And the amount of people that like afterwards were like, Oh, I like to, I saw you on live and I'm like, I didn't know any, like anybody really watched that, but it is like, you know, it gets mundane for us cause we do it every day, but mm-hmm. there's a bunch of people who don't do it and it's like just cool to see. And yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you forget that. Well, you know, it's funny. I get kids at work sometimes are like, yeah, I see people blowing glass on Instagram. I'm like, oh man, are they watching pipe makers? And these, these are like young kids too saying this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of wondering what they're talking about because I don't question it, you know, but I was like, oh, that's cool. But I'm like, now you're in person. You can get the, the heat and the smells and everything else going on, you know, kind of thing. But I think yeah, it's, 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 it's it a cool is thing. cool though. You just like, you see like some of these like people you look up to are just like on live and you can like just sign in and watch them like watch com finish up a bird or something just like from your living room yeah i mean it's like free fucking classes more or less you know it's like you're getting yeah. to understand what's going on yeah i mean you know obviously nothing replaces like the teacher's input of yep. like explaining what they're doing while they're doing it because yeah it is amazing how much you don't actually see like what they're actually doing you know what i mean like, yeah yeah kind of like where they're putting the heat or something that like that little bit of explanation kind of like really actually clarifies everything for me I, I, like sometimes I, yeah i need that yeah audio I'm, yeah, yeah i'm gonna say i'm an audio and visual learner myself like i the, both of them together help me enforce what it is i'm trying to figure out yeah which makes a huge difference but yeah, man. So, so, so we worked, I was going to say earlier with the the tournament for myself. Like, I was actually glad that I didn't get through the first round because I didn't realize how fast the second round was starting. And I basically that was my last night in the studio. Was at my old studio was my my first round, and oh. and I went into it like I, I was contemplating what to make and I knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure how to how to go about it. And I wanted to make it because I'm all about like when I'm doing my functional stuff, my sculptural stuff per se. I like to have it so you can put it on a shelf and you can't tell it's a pipe, you know. And I was trying to yeah, think yeah, about like in. the function of how to go about it. And so I had initially an idea and uh, JD Mables then hit me up. He's like, with, with with the concept I had, he's like, you know what, that if we're, if we're going for a Chillum or a Wunny, that's definitely more of a Sherlock. And I was like, oh, I didn't think about it that guy. <laughs> so now so I was going to take the entire concept of what I, what I did in the first round. And I was going to do that same exact piece in every single round, but change it up just a bit. So it evolve it, evolve into- it yeah, to the piece. So th- my, cause like my bubbler was going to be like the whole thing, like the base, the wave, the dolphin was all going to be connected as one functional piece. But it, because of my moving, I had, I would have, I would have had to have dropped out 
you know, I mean, dude, I don't want to bring him up, but we had one of our guys that had a super huge tragedy happen also, which is like heartbreaking. And, uh, I don't know about you, bro, but that made me like count my blessings and, and re- oh, yeah, you know, that was like think about super, shit that I complain about. <laughs> super real. And he took, he handled it like a champ. Yeah. I knew him from Salem and, and um, yeah, I obviously was re- really excited. It was like me, him and our other friend that was also at Salem all in the competition. I was like, had all these plans to like, you know, face him off all in the end. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, it like really just, I don't know. It made you yeah, appreciate it, like you're saying. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, and Everything, then freaking, yeah. and then a couple of our friends out there in Texas that lost their houses and studios and shit. Oh, like I, geez, I could, yeah. You know, I got a whole box of scraps I just got packed up here. I'm sending out there tomorrow for them just to help them get some stuff going. Gotcha. Is he all resettled or he still so? Yeah, he was. He, last I talked to him, he was just, they had just gotten home. The waters resided faster than they thought they were going to, so they could actually get into their house. But I mean, from what I understood, everything was completely trashed. Like at their house, the studio, the whole nine yards, they lost yeah, everything. I, I saw, saw some of the pictures. Of, uh, it was pretty shitty. I don't know. It's like tough, you know? Yeah, there's dude. Nothing you can really. T- no, there's not. And we like, we had Irma come through. Do you and, prepare for that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You can't prepare for 20 feet of water to come in your backyard like that. It's like. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking scary shit. And like we had Irma come through and we had tornado warnings. And I mean, there was a point in time where I was probably the most scared I've ever been in my life. But we got through it. I didn't have power for five days, but like still thinking about the folks that got hit first thing with Irma. And then everybody out in Texas, I was like, I have nothing I can bitch about whatsoever. Right, you yeah. know, I don't care how hot it yeah. is. I didn't sleep for like two and, and a half days, but you know, yeah, I'm over here complaining that I'm like blowing glass in a horse barn. Or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easy. It's easy to do. It's easy to complain. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know here in Florida, yeah. when it's, you know, we complain about it being too hot, and then we complain about it being too cold, and it's not raining enough, then it's raining too much. It's like, man, we just bitch about everything here in Florida. We're all we're spoiled. <laughs> yeah, th- we all yeah. are. Yeah, we all. I mean, I was about Did to say you- that. Yeah, completely. <laughs> do you ever uh, end up making the pieces? that you would have made in the further rounds no not yet i actually haven't i haven't done much glass at all since then i did a little bit i helped my uh my roommate or ex-roommate slash student um wrap up a couple pieces he's he's such a smart kid and he's a, he's got such drive and motivation to want to like be successful that he, he's taking on things that he shouldn't be making type stuff <clears throat> I mean, like you know you're talking about making rigs from the very beginning and and he's picking it up pretty quickly but i had to like help him fine tune a couple things so my last couple of weeks of glass blowing have been just fine tuning his ass more than anything yeah yeah i mean it's got its up it's like good parts and bad parts of like trying to push yourself too fast like you get used to challenging yourself which i think is a good thing and like n- like you know constantly stepping out of your comfort zone but yeah also doing the same thing and developing a comfort zone and the confidence of like just like knowing what you're gonna do and what's gonna happen when you do it or whatever it so i yeah it's definitely a balance of trying to like make the most complicated thing you can or yeah just like driving home the things you've learned Mm mm-hmm yeah, I think it's, and it, you know, there was, but talks about finding that balance. And I kind of think that finding that balance is a joke at times if it actually really doesn't exist. You know? <laughs> right. It's like chasing the dragon. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, man. I mean, literally with us in terms of the fire and shit, but you know, it's it definitely, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's like, there's, there's so many times where I'm like, yeah, I, I get these inspirations and ideas and I'm like, man, I want to do that, but I know I need to do this instead, but I think I'm going to do this instead. And then it cracks right. and breaks on me and I'm all fucking pissed off at myself because I didn't just didn't do the production stuff where I knew I could have gotten through it and made the money you know, and paid my bills. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's, it's like, I think Jason Lee is always like, you know, preaching, like, get the proto stuff out of the way earlier in the week so you could, like, you know, take the day or two to make that thing that you've been wanting to make that if it breaks, like, yeah, you did all your work earlier in the week. That's so like gonna pay the bills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's and I think too, like to discipline yourself to where you could set like one day a week to a side to say like every Wednesday is my fuck off day or something like that or my exploring day or you know it's not always yeah, easy to do, yeah. but to you know like like you know you and I were talking pre-show about shipping packages and it's like we both we're both laughing at it and almost every artist I've had on here it's like ship shipping stuff is like the most 
easiest, most simple thing to do, but it's the most <laughs> difficult thing to actually accomplish. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and it's it's uh, you know it's and I think about that kind of shit. Like, man, it's I don't know. Yeah, but it's it's important. I mean, they're just as excited to get the piece as you are to sell it. So yeah, like just because you got paid doesn't mean that you shouldn't rush to get it out the door. But yeah, so I've. Yeah, I've tried to like only yeah to avoid the the individual milli sales and the small quantity milli sales because yeah that only leaves me falling behind on my shipping. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that I was gonna I was I had lost my track of thought on that one, but what I was going with it was like I've I've begun to well I haven't in a while, but when I was on my production with Rain or whatever I was doing, I was making Thursdays like my day to ship, and that way I can get it out Thursday at the latest, and then they would have it by Monday, you know, kind of thing. And I would That's get, a good way to do it. you know, and I would get an order in on Wednesday and I would tell them if I can get it done tonight, I'll ship it tomorrow. But if not, I have to wait till next Thursday. And right. you're like, yeah, Thursday's post office. Yeah. And, th- and that way you can let your customers know, like, this is the day that I ship and I'm sorry, but I can't ship until next week. And you, and it's, unless it's like an emergency or it's a birthday present that they, you know, or something like that, you know, you can make exceptions, but if you make the exception, yeah, yeah. maybe you should charge a little extra for it, you know, because you're making the exception for the, for the rule in Ex- a sense. Expedited shipping fee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, because I, th- I think by that it helps to keep you disciplined, especially for a lot of us that work at home. And it's not, you know, working at home takes enough discipline as it is, much less setting up your schedule for the rest of your week of other things you have to do outside of your business, like, you know, packing, right. packing yeah. orders. And, and my old shop was right next to the post office and I wasn't good. Now I'm like 10 minutes away from the post office. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, I know I've had Rashawn Jones on a couple of times. And he's like, dude, the post office is across from my house and the pa- packages still sit here for fucking two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> Where it's like, oh, I just don't have the right size box at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that, man, because I, I, this new post office I've had to like I had to go find by my new place. Every time I've gone there the last month, they have like no boxes at all, and I I don't usually use the priority boxes unless it's something like super small, and I just usually you know use the small boxes. But uh, for this shipping this glass out, I was wanting to get the large priority boxes just because it's you know one fee it doesn't matter how much it weighs. And they right. haven't had boxes for the last two weeks, so I was like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go today and see if they have them." And they were all restocked up, so I've grabbed a shit ton of them just to make sure I had you backups, go. you know. But you know, I guess what we were talking pre-show, it's so easy just to set your shit up to where you can have it picked up at your house. And I know some folks don't like to have that necessarily happen because they don't have a good space that their studio's in or house or whatever. But for the convenience factor of it, they don't charge you any extra for it. You can just leave all your stuff out there. If you have like a little basket, you can put them in or something like that and just leave a little note out there for your post per, post person and they can just pick them up for you. Yeah, uh, I'm going to look into that. I have a very long driveway, so I don't know about leaving everything at the end of the driveway, but I'm sh- yeah, I'm sure if you like, yeah, there's a way to... Yeah, I just alert I, the po- postman or something. Yeah, dude, if you have like a regular mailbox, I just take a you know a little index card and use the same one every time and just stick it in the mailbox with my flag up, and then just says you know please pick up boxes at front door. Oh, gotcha. You know, because I I know a lot of folks have the you know like I even here at my house the mailman just drives in their little truck and they just keep on driving. Right, just <laughs> continues on, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've made it now a habit of putting them on my little rocking chair on the front porch with a note in the mailbox saying please pick up. <laughs> Yeah, that is definitely something I am going to look into because if I don't have to leave the house to send stuff, it saves me that much more time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's funny, dude. I, I, you know, it's like I can't say that we're all lazy because I don't think we're lazy. I think it's just that we're unmotivated to go to the post office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got we got different priorities. Yeah. <laughs> Even though our, our, you know, bless them, our customers are out there waiting for their stuff. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, you know, you're like, in your mind, you made that piece and you're on to the next piece. So you're like planning what you're going to do next. And sometimes it's hard to like, you know, obviously somebody out there is waiting for what they just paid you for. And, mm-hmm. and they, they are just as anxious to get it. So it's, uh, yeah, I um, yeah. am bad at it, but I understand the importance that I'm yeah, trying, trying to get better at it. Yeah, exactly. I'm. I mean, I'm even yeah. worse returning phone calls when I'm on the torch. You know, it's like fuck. <laughs> I'll see someone text me or oh, call yeah. me. You know, and it's like I'll call you after this piece is over, and then I start the next piece, and it's like fuck. I got to call them, and like three days later, I finally call them back. 
Yeah, then you have 30 unread text messages. Yeah, exactly. And a kiln full of glass. emails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, Bunch man. notifications. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's too funny. Well, I think it's be a, be a good place for us to take a quick break and thank our sponsors here. And then uh, we'll come back and it'll be time for us to crash the kiln. Cool. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Dude Fitness. Lose 10 pounds this month by joining the Zen Dude Fitness four-week jump rope fat loss challenge. Brandon and Dan will take you on a guided journey towards becoming the best you. Get fit, have fun, and find new ways to eat healthy while still enjoying the sweeter side of life. Just takes 20 to 30 minutes a day and no gym required. For more info and to sign up for the free four-week challenge, go to wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. That's wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. All right, cool. We are back. And uh, the Crash in the Killing round consists of seven questions. If you want to give me a 30 to 60 second answer on those, and you can expound upon them as we always right, do. I'll try. Yeah, yeah. If it's if it's five <laughs> minutes, that's fine by me too. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Sometimes I get lost. Yeah, it's all good, man. But the first question I always like to ask is if there is any living glass artist that you haven't worked with yet and you want to, who is it and why? Um, I would say probably Grim because you know his his te- sleeving tech is what helped step my work up and really allowed me to like make anything I visualize. And he's just it was another amazing teacher I had and haven't gotten to make anything with him. Although we have talked briefly about some stuff we could do. Um, so he would be one person basically. Yeah. At any of the, the big Millie guys, I would love to, take a Lauren Stump class one day. That would be cool. Just, the person I learned really from Kaminsky learned a lot of his stuff from uh, uh, Lauren Stump. So it would just be cool to, you know, see the source. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I, get, I need to take a class from Lauren one of these days. I need to get his ass on this show. Oh, jeez. On top of that. <laughs> that, yeah, that, yeah. It'd be a fun conversation. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. That'd be a good episode. Yeah, fuck yeah. So, uh, what are your top five favorite colors, colors in glass? Um, right now, jet black. I use a lot of jet black. Um, I like a lot of opaque colors. Uh, I'm not. I mean, I do obviously appreciate all the new transparency and the fun colors. But yeah, basically, Millie safe colors. I like to stick with in case anything gets left over on the bench. I love chocolate. That's a good, good color. Mm-hmm. Um, Glasstronics green because it's like the only really safe green besides like the chartreuse and olive, which are like you know lighter, lighter greens. But the Glasstronics green is discontinued at the moment. Yeah. So that has been you know you love what you can't have. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how many that was. That's, but, you got yeah. three so far. For, Oh, okay. Um, Star White, I, I usually stick with Star White. Uh, or, um, Arctic Blitz, my shop mate, Glass Monkey, he like has been experimenting. Well, my old shop mate, I just moved out. He's been experimenting with mixing colors from Batch. And he came up with a really cool recipe. It's like a, a light blue, like a couple of shades lighter than raindrop or something, and it's a really, really nice bluish green. Nice. Um, there, yeah, and they do a lot of like dichro wraps too over their colors. So, a bit I use most of my tubing comes from him, just because it's, it's so close, and he makes some really nice tubing, and has also been a, a big teacher and help for me. Hell yeah! Awesome. Working working for two years with him, yeah. Well, what is your uh, worst injury in the studio? Oh, um, when I first started using metal handles to pull my millie, I had allowed one end to get a little too cool, and um, it popped off the the moil, and I like caught 
the the it's like you know a little pancake at the end of a steel rod and uh-huh. i caught the the pancake part and the metal burns are like way worse than glass burns and yeah so i had like basically the size of my palm was was like all severely burned and that was probably the worst one the only one that like kept me off the torch for an extended period of time yeah, which I, I just did a bunch of cold working then but yeah that that was probably the worst one yeah it's like branding your hand <laughs> jesus oh yeah basically luckily the you know cert- the skin on your palm is like very it doesn't scar easily it's like mm-hmm. used to regenerating so there's barely a no scar or anything but nice yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I think I, I I always get asked every day if I burn myself, which I always laugh at. Is that's my answer usually? I just laugh. But uh, yeah, right. It's like it's, a, it's I'm always burning myself on the metal, dude. Whether well, it's my jacks or a fucking our hot head torch the other day I was using, I just reached over and just barely touched the outside edge of the frame of that the opening oh, of the man, torch, yeah. you know. And I still got a nice burn on my arm. It's like shit. My son calls him Chef Burn, so I'm like, yeah, hey kid, I got my I got another Chef Burn at work today. Yeah. <laughs> And he's 10. He loves to cook. So he's always like, hey, dad, I got a chef burn today. I'm like, awesome, dude. Congrats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the metal ones and, and the graphite burn, it's a really bad. Too. Oh, like, man. Yeah. Fucking graphite, yeah. dude. I have probably honestly gotten my most like heavy burns on the bench from grabbing a hot reamer or some dumb oh. shit like that. Or like yeah, hitting, touching like, my touching marble pad. Edge of your pad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck. And oh, I can't man. imagine what you're doing those millies, man. I mean, I know like I do some big shit too, but like a big giant chunk of hot fucking glass on a mill on a on a marver, that marver is sucking up some heat. Oh yeah. It gets super hot and the radiant heat just from the mill like working the millie itself right there. Yeah. It's just like the surrounding area, everything in it. Any glass rod that like even if it hasn't been in the flame, if it's like near where you're working the millie, you pick it up, it's like pretty hot. <laughs> yeah. That that reminds me, I wanted to ask you earlier, do you wear any kind of protection or anything when you're doing beside your glasses and shit when you're doing your millies? <laughs> um Usually just like a uh, like a sweater, just to like keep my um, it like actually does help to have another layer rather than less clothes. Yeah, uh, I know Dapo works in a t-shirt, which at a, I turn into like lobster man basically <laughs> if I like, just don't wear enough stuff. Um, I don't wear gloves. I wish I could, but I, don't, I just like don't like the feeling. But I know a lot of people do wear gloves, and it helps you like be able to work in closer to the milli and longer and mm-hmm. all that stuff is good cool. um face mask i yeah i played around with the face mask for a while it's really good and helpful especially like if the milli gets really big but it, towards the end of the pull i usually take it off just because it's easier to like tell the, uh, read the heat pace yeah exactly do you have a like a uh, blast shield for your torch uh, I did, but I broke it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know I know they sell replacements, but same thing. Like, that thing would get really hot, and I'd end up touching it. And yeah. I, I don't know. Kind of just got used to working without it. Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Cool. Let's see. We got that. Do you have any uh, glass-blowing theme tattoos? I do. I only have two tattoos. I have... Uh, this while I was in Australia on that last trip, I got the uh, Homer Simpson holding like one of my music Sherlock's. You know, nice. Got a little drool coming out of his mouth. It was a little, you know, spur of the moment decision, but it was like a cool artist I follow on Instagram and she like posted while I was in Australia that she had an opening. So I was like, yeah, why not? You know? Hell yeah. That's fun. What about you? Uh, yeah, actually, I have my Carlisle on my arm. I have like a whole space oh, nice. space sleeve, and uh, I had it, had the Carlisle turn into a rocket ship. So the flames are actually coming out of the back ports of the of the oxygen and propane valves, and then I have like a little dome on top and a little alien sitting inside the dome, flying through space. Uh-huh. Cool, cool. Yeah, something something different. So yeah, so it's like not just a, like a torch. It's like your spit on it you know yeah exactly yeah because I, I people that do glass they know what it is right away but then like people that don't they ask about it i'm like yeah this is what i do and then they see my torch i'm working on and then they put two and two together yeah it's funny uh like i've done a couple like uh demos and stuff at like festivals or music things and 
um, you know, people always like come up to you and they're like, like, if you're not working on it, they're like, what is that? And my one friend that I would do them a lot with would always just be like, oh, it's a rocket ship or like it's from space. Like, cause you know, the GTTs are all like rocket looking. Oh yeah. They're super gnarly looking technology yeah. was, <laughs> especially all the guys right, that are getting yeah. them, like powder coated and specialized with like rolled in fucking opals and all <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy like, shit. Yeah. They look crazy. Yeah. And it's like, but yeah, there's sometimes it's a rocket ship type space feeling. Hell yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. So when you are in the studio, do you listen to the radio, watch TV, or do you do both? Um, I do both. Uh, I I like podcasts a lot, and so I, I used I like would listen to podcasts. I'll get get in as early as I can while nobody's there. Listen to a podcast, and then, you know, as people come in, like you put on music or whatever, like everybody's into. And um, yeah, I, both. You know, mm-hmm. keep it interesting. TV, I like I like watching TV, but I, it's hard to like keep yourself from looking up at it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's why I watch a lot of shit that I've seen a thousand times, so I can like watch it in my head. Right, you just know, listen, yeah, yeah, listen yeah. to it. Yeah, there's certain things I won't watch while I'm working because I am like that. I want to like look at the screen and see what's going on. Like uh, I used to do a lot of like watch like a lot of Japanese, uh, you know, anim- anime or. Or right, even like you're samurai like movies. To subtitles. Yeah, totally. So I started making sure I got <laughs> yeah. the ones that had like the English dub over it so I can actually just listen to yeah. it and occasionally glance over. But some of those films are like the actual like samurai movies. Like there was one that was, I think it was called House of a Thousand Gardens or House, something like that. Not not House of a Thousand Corpses, but it was something like that nature, you know, but Japanese. And oh, it was so beautifully yeah, yeah. done, like cinematically wise. I was like, I had to turn my torch off and just sit and watch it because it was just, it was breathtaking, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah, there's nothing worse than getting all baked out and you walk out in your shop and put a movie on. Next thing you know, three hours have gone by and you haven't turned your torch on You're yet. You're watching It Man all day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, dude, I love that fucking movie. Oh, yeah, this, this is really cool. Yeah, the first but, one. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I try and avoid TV. Well, I watch TV while I cold work a lot, but while I'm on the torch, usually just uh, podcasts, audiobooks, and um, music. Hell yeah. Well, speaking of audiobooks, you can uh, get a free 30 day trial at audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio. Uh, there you go. Yeah. How about that? Get a first audiobook for free. <laughs> Just got to throw that oh, plug yeah. in there. <laughs> what, uh, what podcast do you listen to? Um, I like, you know, Joe Rogan's. I like, uh, um, there's like, you know, some more educational ones like the Ted, Ted Talks mm-hmm. and stuff. And, um, Pete Holmes, he's a comedian. He has a really funny one. Hannibal Burris has one. Um, oh, I'm totally forgetting her name. The girl from Broad City has one about art. It's actually really cool. She like goes to a bunch of different museums with guests. Um, cool. Oh, what's her name? I forgot her name, but it's called A Piece of Work. Is the name of the podcast, and it's it's a really good one. I recommend it. Hell yeah! Have you listened to uh, Hardcore History? I have that's Dan yeah Dan, um, Dan uh, Carlin yep yeah yeah those are great I have listened to a few episodes yeah those are really good yeah. it's like yeah you're listening to a story you're also learning about history yeah and it's like eight hours long <laughs> you know <it's> right <laughs> next thing you know you got a full count yeah exactly dude you learn about World War II <laughs> <laughs> you know that you that dude he's a, he amazes me the way he tells a story and like his way like he just like you know just talks in his his way he reads things and i've always wanted to listen to him like read like a aesop's fable or a children's book of some sort just you know he's just so intriguing just listen to him yeah, talk yeah. you know um oh actually there's a uh, short stories with uh, damn i'm really bad at names if you could tell oh dude i'm the same way it's all but, um the yeah. It's on the top charts, but yeah, there's a famous children's book. Somebody that read a lot of children's books um, just started doing like adult short stories, and it's not like adult, but you know, just like short stories, and um, it's really cool every week. Hell yeah! Have you ever listened to uh, Night Vale? No, what's that? Uh, it's the strangest storytelling show i've heard yet it's basically it takes a, it takes place in this town called nightvale and it's completely it's hard to describe but basically the premise is that you're listening to the local dj of the town he he does like the local news and weather and traffic and stuff like that and 
behind the scenes, there's always something going on in the town. They have, he has like local people coming in and talking on the show and stuff. But it's like, it's so fucking out. I can't even describe it as so out there. But like, for instance, he'll do like, now it's time for the weather and they'll play music instead. Like a, they'll put a band on <laughs> and play music. Nice. Or, you know, or like they'll talk about like the local community bulletin board and like th- there was one episode where he starts off and he's like, okay, so the local, the local community center wants you to memorize these words. And he reads off like 20 words. And then they have like, the show goes on at the very end of it. He's like, Oh, breaking news. Uh, we're told that if you memorize those words, you will be blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, something bad will happen oh. to you. And there's like this dog park in the, in the town that you're not allowed to go to. Cause it's like a dimensional portal to this other thing. Like it's just, all kind of weird fucking shit goes on in this town, but the way that the story and the writing is done, it's so good and so intriguing that you can't help but like just listen to every. I always start off with episode one. I think they've got like five seasons now, um, but just like and just like listen because you gotta like kind of like get into it. You can pick up anywhere in the seasons per se, but I recommend going back all the way to number one and just like listening through the evolution of the show. It's gotten to a point where the show became so popular that they've launched four other podcasts that are that are stories and. It's all, they're all just like interesting, weird stories that they tell. And um, they have a live show that they do now. So it's, it's just all kind of cool stuff that's come out of this, this podcast. It's just fascinating stuff. But yeah, welcome, nice. welcome cool. tonight, yeah. Bill. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, it's fun. It'll, it'll make you cringe and laugh and question <laughs> your, question yourself. It's like, what are the, what are these people on? It's interesting. Yeah, cool. That's yeah. what I like. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> So yeah, man. So the last question I was like to ask is, uh, which I've changed here in the last couple of months, but it's, uh, what are your five favorite tools besides your glasses and your torch? Uh, five favorite tools, butter knife. The graphite one is like, that is basically the tool I use to make most of my shapes in my mailies, like the contours. And so I go, go through like those guys pretty quickly. I use them in the flame and abuse them and, Hell yeah. you know, Get, get whatever I need out of it. The paddles, I love like my big, big paddle for like, rounding out the millie. I L marver a lot, like shaping my tubes more than I'd like to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I use my L marver, my jacks, which I just lost at melt, unfortunately. Oh, fuck. That sucks. Yeah. I, I'm like bad about like hopping around from bench to bench and leaving tools in places and not blaming anybody of course that yep. everybody there was very very respectful and nobody had anything like stolen or anything right but i uh, just like leave things places and yeah so i was a little upset about that um so i think that was four yep. um let's see my last favorite tool i guess the finishing tool because you know it's always a good thing when you're at that part hell yeah yeah, man, something yeah. I've always recommended is for people to use electric tape or some kind of, because there's so many different colors nowadays, just like to wrap your handles with, with electric tape. Just pick oh, color yeah, yeah. or duct tape even, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I did have all my stuff marked from Salem. I like etched it. I have, like, they have a little tremble there because it's a you know a common thing when you're like going in and out of the Salem classroom every day, like packing up, leaving stuff places. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they have like a little after you get to etch all your your names in cool so maybe maybe it'll turn up one day but for now i'll just get back to you know the brass v tool and stuff and it's good good to you know challenge yourself every once in a while i'll get a new pair soon yeah yeah you ever uh <laughs> use, you ever use a spoon ever a spoon yeah like a to to put for it in or something or? no no just for shaping Oh, I have it. Yeah, get a spoon. Get one that's got like a round handle on it. <clears throat> it's great for convex and contour shapes and pushing and pulling and dragging and there's oh. all kind of things you can do. Like when I do, yeah, uh, I do that. when I'm doing my character work, if I want to do like their bottom jaw, I'll just like keep up a little spot and just push into it with my spoon and actually like pull down and move that mass of glass. So not only am I making like the opening of their mouth, but I'm making their bottom lip and jaw at the same time. Nice. You know, yeah, little, I got like a moves. couple of those dental tools that I use, but I guess that's basically like a bigger version of that. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. Spins are nice. spins are good shit. Sweet. Hell yeah, dude. Well, uh, 
before I let you go here, if you want to tell us where we can find you out there all over cyberspace, and then uh, any cool, kind of yeah. parting piece of advice as well. Yeah, um, original Topher on Instagram. Uh, Topher Marcos on Facebook. I don't really post on Facebook. But yeah, original Topher on Instagram. Hit me up for pieces or collabs, whatever you want. Um, I love making Millie collabs with people, and it's always hard to find people to make Millie's with. So that, and I love teaching how to make Millie's. I um, have been thinking about doing a class, which would be cool. Um, yeah, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I've taught a couple people to make Millie, and I feel like I'm a better teacher than worker, so that should be fun. And yeah, working on my website, originaltoferglass.com. It is not live yet. Um, but yeah. Cool. Part, parting advice, just have fun with it. And yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much yeah. short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, brother. Well, again, hang on after a while. Say goodbye here. I'll say goodbye off the air. But uh, appreciate right, you coming cool. on and sharing the knowledge and stuff. And uh, you know, it's a lot of fun having you on here. And again, cool. I look forward to thanks. Thanks meet. for having me and listening to my rambles. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I ramble all the time too. So it'd be a good episode yeah. of rambles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this episode with Topher. You can again find him out there on Instagram at Topher's Originals. We'll have all the posts and instance tags and all that good shit in the show notes down below. And until next time, enjoy this episode 175 of the Wise Guy Radio Show. And we'll see you next week. Y'all take it easy. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.